and my father who worked in heaven, or my dad got hurt by that police. Please tell him to get a better job. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Amen. Kenya has been ranked dismally as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. MP, 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 MP. <laughs> Boniface Mwangi, folks, this young man is one word, fearless. Why are you arresting me? Why are you arresting me? Why are you arresting me? What have I done? Where are you going? I'm going to topple the government. I can only imagine how scared I'd be, see my husband taken to the streets. Now he wants to try his hand at politics. What? My heart is made up that I'm going to vibe. <laughs> this is how you're telling it. <laughs> Does Boniface Mwangi have uh, deep pockets? No, he doesn't. Is he on the right side of uh, the tribal kingpin? No, he's not. He is going to be a casualty of other forces beyond him. Do not come home. They will kill you. Activist Boniface Mwangi receiving death threats that for the first time target his wife and children as well. It feels like just jumping into a river of crocodiles. Hi everyone, my name is Roger Ross Williams and welcome to the Academy Visiting Artists Series. Uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker based in New York and Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and I've been making documentaries to show real life and real situations and real people for a long time. A number of my films are focused in Africa and I'm passionate about helping the next generation of African filmmakers tell their own stories. I am so excited to be here in conversation with the amazing African filmmaker and dear friend of mine, Tony Kamau. Tony is an IDA PGA nominee and the youngest female African documentary producer to be invited as a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences documentary branch. As a producer and writer and founder of We Are Not the Machine, a Nairobi-based production company, she tells stories of outsiders, rebels, and change makers. The Sundance Special Jury Prize winner and POV co-production Softy, produced by Tony and directed by Sam Soko, premiered at the Sundance in 20, Film Festival in 2020 in the World Cinema Documentary Feature Competition. It was selected as the opening night film of Hot Docs and won the Oscar qualifying Best African Documentary Award at the Durban Film Festival. Tony is currently in production on a feature documentary on home and belonging and in development on a documentary series exploring the legacy of colonialism in Kenya. I am so excited to get a chance to talk to Tony and Tony, thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Roger. It's yes. amazing chatting to you. It's, it feels like it's coming full circle because you are actually the first documentary director um, I ever saw um, an Itfa um, who looked like me. Um, it, was, it was God Loves Uganda, and I keep on telling everyone this story, uh, Pete, uh, Kenyan director. And I, you know, we saw you for the first time talking about your experience. And I think at that moment, we realized that we as people of color could tell stories for the global stage. So it's, it's just amazing to be here and talking to you. Well, I was really excited um, when I met you for the first time because for so long, so many people have been um, from the outside of going to Africa and telling your stories. And it was so exciting to meet a community of filmmakers who are telling your own stories. It's about time. Um, 
I think I want to start with like the beginning, you know, for, for you and your career and um, sort of, you know, what inspired you to pursue a film and in, in, uh, a career in filmmaking and documentary filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, I've always loved story. Um, when I was a child, um, my mother was away. <laughs> my late mother was away for most of my childhood. Um, she was studying in the UK, uh, her PhD. And the only way I was really able to understand the world that she lived in, which just seemed so separate and alien, was by watching TV. So I think for me, TV holds a special place because it's it gives you a chance to explore other worlds and other cultures. And yeah, I think I went to film school in Kenya. I was initially interested in working in fiction, but I watched Hoop Dreams, um, absolutely loved the documentary. And it was just so interesting to understand that, oh my God, you can get this insight into people's um, experiences and you can find you know, this sense of universality um, that I felt was kind of missing from fiction in a way that I can't really um, articulate uh, right now, but it just felt like it was something um, so special to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think it's, you know, important for our audience to sort of, you know, understand the difference between sort of documentary yeah. and um, fiction storytelling. And um, the, the, the beautiful thing about documentary and, and something like Hoop Dreams is that you can, you can live, you can follow uh, this, a, a real life story for uh, sometimes people 10 years or longer or 20 years and, and really get the full scope of, you know, sort of, you know, human existence. And that's a beautiful thing. So tell me, you know, what kind of stories do you like to tell? What is, what is the sort of, you know, what is Tony love? What are your, like, you know, the, you, 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 you tend to um, really focus on, you know, stories of people sort of, you know, like softy, like challenging um, the system and, um, but there's also a, a deep humanity to the types of stories that you tell, but tell us what you love, those, what kind of stories you really love. Yeah, um, so really drawn to working with talented directors like Sam Soko of Soft Tea and um, Pete of I Am Samuel. And, you know, we come from a society, I'll speak specifically about Kenya because that's where I grew up. We come from a country where from the time you go to school, actually like kindergarten, you're told to conform, you're told to toe the line, you're never allowed to question authority. Um, everything is supposed to be kind of cookie cutter and it's because our education is based um, um, on colonial ways um, of framing the world um, and you know, training people to be these factory workers or people work in farms um, for the colonial masters. So, People like Boniface, you know, our, our subject in, in soft tea, um, are very interesting to me because I always wonder, like, what is it about them that makes them rail against the system, that makes them actually question, um, you know, their place in society or how society is working? So I, I find those kind of people very, very fascinating, specifically because of the community I grew up in. And I want to be a little bit more like them. So I'm really attracted to those kind of stories, to be honest, um, be because I'm just constantly trying to unravel and unpack that um, um, with every single project that I get attached to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, taking on a project like Softy is was um, really interesting because you had all of this footage. And, um, and Talk about like as a you know as a, as a producer as a filmmaker how you sort of found that unique story within the footage. Wow! Yes, that was outside of fundraising. <laughs> that was one of the biggest I think challenges that we had um, in Soft Tea because Soko, the director and the team, um, I mean, we'd filmed over five hundred hours. We had over five hundred hours of footage. Um, and it was very easy um, to maybe try and tell this narrative 
um, about you know, a country that's struggling with democracy and this activist is always on the streets. But um, Soko as a director and us as a film team were very committed to telling the family story, the personal story, because we felt that that was also important to look at this you know, young marriage, <laughs> you know, two people struggling to balance priorities because we felt there was a parallel between that and you know, citizens of a country balancing their relationship or trying to navigate their relationship with a young state. Um, so I think for us, we, we really had a lot of conversations as a film team, um, just about like, you know, what, what's, what's the core of the story? What do we want audiences to leave here with? And when we felt that we had an understanding of what our arc would be, um, it was, I think, easier for Soko and the edit team to really be able to now dive back into the footage and start marking footage. And once everyone kind of like, I think there was a, there was a bit of a stalemate where people were talking about which scenes should be in the film. Um, one of our amazing editors, Ryan, Ryan Mullins, just came and just quickly uh, <laughs> edited together a rough structure. And then we had a framework um, to be able to kind of like um, build around. Um, I, so I would say the beginning was fast and very slow at the same time because it took us a, it took us about a year you know to get to a structure um, from when we actually like committed um, to editing um, but it also happened very fast because the edit on the computer was done in like a few weeks after yeah. months of talking and months of looking through footage yeah well yeah, yeah. i mean these films are built in the edit room for sure so yeah. um Talk to me about the role of a producer in documentary film and, you know, sort of how that role progresses and changes from development to production to post-production to, you know, selling and marketing the film. Yeah, um, I think being a producer, it, it, <laughs> it's always one of, I think, the hardest roles to explain. Um, I think especially specifically in documentary because it's it's become so nebulous. Sometimes people think a producer is someone who brings money to the table or someone who brings access. So it is something that the industry is kind of grappling with, you know, just in terms of like who should actually get credited as a producer. Um, but I would, how I see producing, um, I would say, that you're the one who ensures that the director's creative vision um, is protected and you're the one who ensures that you're able to you know gather resources whether it's a team whether it's fundraising you know whether it's the right publicist when you get to releasing the film so you make sure you gather resources um, that are also able to ensure that the director's creative vision um, is achieved and you're also a therapist sometimes <laughs> because, so because uh, you know directing documentaries is not easy <laughs> So uh, uh, I think that's why it's also important to just have a good relationship with their director because you talk a lot about, you know, just the process of making the film or the process of dealing with characters and subjects because it's, I mean, it's a complicated relationship, you know, uh, the, the relationship between a director and a subject. You are, you know, you're friends to a certain degree, but on the other hand, you kind of have to separate yourself from the person so you can maintain a level of objectivity when you're trying to figure out what the story is. So it's a delicate balance. And I think um, having a producer involved, especially from the beginning is, is really important, I would say for um, creative, for directors, for documentary directors, you just have that creative sounding, creative sounding board. Um, but if I was to just um, talk about it in a very structured manner, um, I would say the producer is in documentary. Um, you make sure that you know, you're able to get access to characters in writing releases. So making sure you secure releases in the beginning um, of development or at least at some point in production um, so that you can actually be able to finish the film and release it. Um, then I would say it's also about helping to put the proposal together with the director and the pitch package, reviewing materials, um, fundraising. Um, if 
for example, Soft Tea, after we fundraised, we were a global team that was spread in Kenya, Canada, the UK. So a lot of my job when we were like getting into post-production was just coordinating the team and managing different interests. Like we all believed in the film, but you know, we, we, we always had to just kind of like um, keep on checking in and making sure that we were on the same page and that we were, you know, every time the, the edit changed, we just had to make sure that we were on the same path. And we also kind of had to make sure that we were all um, being supportive of the director because it's very easy to lose track and for people to be making different films within the same project, um, as I have come to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, and I think outside of that, um, you know, coordinating the team, it's also just about like meeting deadlines, whether it's submitting um, for grants, whether it's, you know, submitting the film to festivals. And once the documentary is complete and you've secured all releases uh, for music and any archive, and that you made sure that you've um, produced the project within budget, you know, the next stage is then managing the release of the film, uh, which was something very new for me with my first two features, Softy and I Am Samuel, because my previous experience was working as a documentary um, director and producer for Al Jazeera BBC World. And when you finished the documentary, that was it. Like you didn't have to think about anything else. Um, you locked picture, you delivered, and that was it. So I would say one of the steepest learning curves for, uh, specifically for Soft Tea, for Soko and I, as uh, because we were both producers in that, was managing the release and distribution and dealing with sales agents. That was that was quite hectic. And then uh, an awards campaign because we got nominated for the PGAs. That was quite, um, that was a steep learning curve. <laughs> a whole new set of skill sets um, were developed. It's, it's, it's a lot. And, um, you know, people often ask me, they're like, what does a producer do? I'm like, they do a lot. They do everything. They're running the show. They're keeping it all together for, for all of us. Um, well, let's break it down a little bit for people who want to, you know, get into this, into filmmaking, you know, so the most important thing is how do, how do people fund, you know, how do people fund these projects? How do you find funding? How did you go about that with Softy? And I am Samuel. Yeah, um, so I mean, it's interesting. Um, in Kenya, there are not that many sources of public financing or public funding um, for factual um, documentary projects. Um, a lot of times when we're working on this social justice um, kind of uh, documentaries, we're doing the exact kind of work that government public funds do not want <laughs> to be released yeah. out into the world. Um, so, I mean, our, how we got our funding was uh, first through DocuBox, um, which <laughs> you're on the board of, um, on the board. <laughs> which was started by fellow Academy member uh, Judy Kibinge, uh, co-founded, yeah, founded by Judy Kibinge. So we got some funding from her. And with Softy, we also got funding from Ford Foundation. Actually, Soko got seed funding before I joined the project from Ford Foundation because in the beginning he wanted to do an activist, activist manual. He had no intentions of actually doing a feature. Like, yeah, he keeps on saying that. And I'm like, 500 hours for an activist <laughs> manual. Um, not very efficient. So. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but it was amazing because he keeps on telling that story. And I just think it's the most amazing story in the world because it's such a fantastic film. Um, yeah, so yeah, so he got seed funding from Ford Foundation um, around 2013 and Doc Society um, and Hot Docs came on board. Um, I joined the project after he had done about four years, done the majority of principal photography. And then we got into Hot Docs Forum and we were the first uh, Kenyan team um, to pitch at Hot Docs Forum, uh, which we had no idea what we were going to do there, but we went there anyway. Um, and at first we were really nervous because we had seen the id for forums, which um, seemed very intimidating and the hot dog forums were people yeah, in oh my god it was so, are, we, we were so nervous <laughs> we were so nervous and we were thinking should so do we have to have like a script and do we have to be very formal like a lot of these filmmakers from Europe um, who have all of these credits and I mean it was amazing because we were working with such an incredible team at I Steal Film 
Um, and the team there, Miller and Bob, had done some incredible pitches. I remember there's a pitch they did in hot dogs where they were wearing fireman suits and they were in the audience, and then they just stood up and everyone was like, What? <laughs> I can't remember. What was. I think everyone talks about that pitch, but I don't think, I don't know if anyone remembers what the film was. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they were so amazing at pitches. And, and I mean, we really discussed what made a great pitch. And outside of the basics of, you know, being able to, you know, say who, what, where, and to be able to show access to the character and what the team was, um, what made a great pitch was leaning into your authentic selves as a team and why um, you as a team wanted to do this project. And for us, Soft Tea um, was a story and a project that we were working on because we had a deep love for our country. We had a lot of questions about our complicated relationship with it. Um, and that's what we leaned into. And as, as a first time producer pitching at Hot Docs, I didn't have a list of credits. So uh, actually when we were pitching at Hot Docs, we just, we, we leaned into authentic selves and um, we gave ourselves roles. Like I'm very enthusiastic and we were happy to be there as first time filmmakers. So we just, you know, we riled up the crowd and we we're like, yeah, happy to be here. Like shout out to Doc Society, shout out to, to Just Film, shout out to all our partners. And, you know, we love our country, we love being here. And I think everyone was a bit shocked. They were like, oh my God, the Africans are very like <laughs> expressive. <laughs> you know, it's, so, it's yeah, so everyone was like so happy. And I think, you know, we, we came with great energy because we really did not want to be telling another story about how Africa, an African country has a failed democracy. That was not the story that we wanted to tell. Um, we wanted to tell you know, a story of hope, a story of possibility. And we leaned into that with our pitch and Soko um, did a pitch where he was talking over the trailer. So he was weaving in and out of the trailer, which was risky and it worked. <laughs> And out of, out of participating in Hot Docs Forum, which is very scary for us, um, yeah, we got POV on board as a co-producing partner, a co-production partner. We got BBC Storyville later down the line, Sundance. Um, so I would say for Softy Story. Got it all. Yeah, we, we, I mean, not Got the momentum. Day, but <laughs> it took six months six to, months to a year of talking back and forth with people who had expressed an interest. Because fundraising is about, it's also about, you know, it's about establishing a relationship with someone. It's about, you know, getting someone to be part of the team as a funder. Uh, we have been fortunate that we had people, um, you know, um, doubling down their commitment um, um, more than once. Doc Society doubled down their commitment like three times and even supported Impact, uh, Luminate, our other funder, double down their commitment. And that's because we didn't treat them as an ATM machine, but mm -hmm. we treated them as partners, as collaborators. Yeah. And we kept on having conversations with them about yeah. what our vision was um, for the documentary and for our audience outreach and engagement. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about sort of breaking into the, the doc, you know, the, the Kenya and what you guys have done as um, in, in this nonfiction space in Kenya is remarkable. You, you, it's a game changer for um, nonfiction in, in Africa. And what was, you know, when I first met you guys, and I believe it was, I can't remember if it was Hot Docs or I, uh, I, ID, IDFA, but um, the, was the, that enthusiasm. I remember like, um, you and Judy Kabinge from, from Document just coming up to me so excited and like we are so excited we want to meet people and I was like you guys are great and I was like and they're like you want to meet people and I pointed out I remember we were in I think it was Sheffield um, the Sheffield Duck Fest and um, I was pointing out people in the room and then you guys would go up to them and be I was like that person's important that's that's Simon Kamari he's head of the IDA and you guys would go okay I'm gonna go up to him like hey Simon and it's just so great and um and you and what you've done is you've you 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 gained the respect of 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 the industry and you've 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 sort of charted a way for um for really for African nonfiction filmmakers to, um, to, to, to people to take notice and be like, wait a minute, 
why, why are we going there and telling these like, you know, devastating stories of, of, um, instead of embracing the stories that you want to tell? So, but how is it navigating sort of the Kenyan film industry, you know, versus the Western film industry? You know, because there's been some some issues around censorship, around um, you know all kinds of problems in 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 Kenya of getting your films released. Yeah, I mean, I, I could just speak a little bit to um, our enthusiasm for being out there at Idfa, Sheffield, um, Hot Dogs. Um, listen, we for a very long time, uh, people who look like me, people who look like Soko, Pete, were not telling our stories. And for and the reason why I said earlier on, like I feel like it's coming full circle, um, and I truly do mean it, is because for a long time we thought that you know creative documentaries or documentaries that could be at A festivals or even fiction films that could be at A festivals, you know that was the preserve of Western filmmakers, um, largely white male Western filmmakers. And it just felt like something that was completely inaccessible for us um, in so many different ways because we don't have access to um, development funding for projects. Um, for a long time, we really did not have the skill set um, to really be able to do, um, to produce and direct um, creative documentaries, creative character driven documentaries. Like Soko honestly just kept on filming and filming and he had such an incredible access and he had, you know, um, such an incredible subjects that he was filming with. And it was through watching documentaries, it was through watching these lectures, uh, videos we were watching about hot dogs and it for online. Um, where we were mostly seeing these white filmmakers talking about the process. So when we got there, um, we were ready to take advantage of every single opportunity because we also understood that this wasn't just about us as a film team, but it was also just about the next generation. I don't even say the next generation. It was about the next filmmakers um, who are going to come after, after us. And there's people who have projects in post-production like Zippy Kimundu, she's doing an amazing documentary about Mau Mau. Um, so we were going to kick the door open and leave it open so that other people can come there because we didn't want to be um, the only people having a seat at the table. And we did not want to be seen as these unicorns, these special Africans who can tell specific films because we wanted people to understand there was more of us um, coming there. So that's why we were very enthusiastic because we, we knew that this was an amazing opportunity that could potentially transform our independent documentary industry in Kenya. Um, so that's why there's all this enthusiasm with that project and with all the other projects that we do, because it we do truly feel like we're in a very special moment uh, where we're finally having access and we're finally, you know, talking to the right people um, at the probably right room, maybe not the right table, but probably right room. <laughs> but that's okay because before we didn't even know the room existed. Um, and I would say like navigating the Kenyan industry when it comes to censorship. Um, I would say a lot of that, I mean, it's difficult right now in Kenya uh, because Softy got an 18 classification um, with the Kenyan Film and Censorship Board. Um, oh. They said, yeah, it did, it did, it did. It, what uh, is this 18 said, classification? What does that mean? Um, 18 plus. So only people mm -hmm. over the age of 18 could watch what? it at the theater Why is uh, or on TV in its current format. Um, and the reasons given was police brutality, which mm. I thought was amazing. Um, and, you know, th they talked about post-election violence. A lot of this stuff had been on TV. They couldn't outright ban it because we'd been so public about our release um, at Sundance and we kept on making noise about it because that was a strategy. Like, let's make as much noise as possible about the film. Let's be enthusiastic. Let's get everyone talking so that let's just make it so difficult for anyone to even try and ban this film because we wanted it to be seen. Um, and that was just our strategy. Let's be loud, let's be noisy, let's celebrate as much as we can because uh, who wants to be a party pooper? Um, so I think that was, our <laughs> that was our strategy with dealing with censorship. And distribution is another challenge in Kenya. Um, we really had to 
I mean, we really, really had to lobby um, the local distributor Crimson um, to be able to even just look at the documentary because in Kenya, when people think about documentaries, they think that it's about water, you know, building a well or something like that. So for them to think that it's engaging, like we had to keep on calling the distributor and telling her, hey, have you watched it? Hey, have you watched it? So she just finally watched it after she got tired of me calling her. And when she watched it, she was like, oh my God, this is amazing. We need to get in all the theaters. And I think that, so I think for us, um, because we're in this phase where we're kind of like pioneers in Kenya, uh, when it comes to independent uh, documentaries, theatrical documentaries, uh, because people have done other sorts of documentaries and uh, fiction, um, there's a lot of education that we need to do um, as um, in our generation. And we're happy to do it because we, ab we absolutely just love documentary yeah. storytelling. Um, yeah. I've, I found it very transformative in my life. Yeah. Um so you're educating people all, all around, <laughs> both sides. You're educating the, the West, <laughs> educating the, the Kenyans. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, 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 in, incredible. And, you know, you mentioned a lot of organizations, and I think that yeah. it's important for filmmakers to understand some of the opportunities in these organizations. Um, I think, I believe I met you, you, I think I met you, it was Blue Ice, right? Yes. It was Blue Ice, um, where um, you and, and Pete were, were working on I Am Samuel. And I remember I, you, I saw that work and I saw your, both of your enthusiasm and I was like, I'm signing on. I want to be executive producer. I want to work with these guys. Um, uh, so talk about some of the opportunities available to, 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 to filmmakers um, in Kenya. Um, like Blue Ice and of course the amazing Docky Box. Yes, um, I think right now um, is an incredible time to be an independent um, storyteller um, from the continent because I, I think right now there's an increased interest, you know, in diverse stories. A lot of people are committed to that across the board. So I, I'm just like, if you have an idea and you want to get it done, I think now's the time, don't wait. Um, so I would say um, organizations that you could reach out to for production funding would be DocuBox, uh, which is based in Kenya. It's um, East Africa's um, first independent um, documentary and film fund. Um, then there's also DOCA, um, which um, is Africa-wide. Um, they have development um, funding. They also have um, production funding. I know they have impact distribution funding. Outside of that, they have, they have funds outside of the continent, um, like Hot Dogs Blue Ice, that's interested in supporting um, African storytellers. Um, uh, both my projects, um, Softy and I'm Samuel, um, got funding from there. And I know so many other filmmakers who got that. There's IDFA as well. So, um, and Sundance. Um, Sundance has also just um, refocused its fund um, to, be, to finance um, documentary storytellers from the communities um, where they're telling the stories. So that means no more, they're not interested in <laughs> really supporting parachute filmmaking, as I like to uh, call it. Which, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> comes in and tells the story and leaves. Um, I mean, they want someone who actually has some level of connection and understanding of their communities, which is why I'm just saying like, right now is the perfect time to be, um, to be developing yeah. stories. Yeah, so yeah. I'd say grants, yeah, Ford Foundation. Um, yeah, I would say, I would say if, if as an African storyteller at, at this point, it's mostly grants, it's mostly grant organizations. So yeah. specific documentary grant organizations like the one I talked about and also thematic funding organizations because they could be an organization that doesn't directly support documentary but maybe it's a climate change organization and you would you could be able to convince them um, to finance um, your documentary or to support it um, and later on support its distribution um, in, in their target um, communities. That so I think those are the interesting ways you could be able to raise financing. Um, and you know what's what's really interesting, what's changing now is there are now commercial opportunities, and now mm -hmm. um, huge streamers like Netflix 
are mm-hmm. on the continent and looking for content. And um, that that gives an opportunity for, for filmmakers to actually, mm-hmm. you know, make real money and not, you know, be just reliant on grants. So maybe talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I do know that they have come into Africa in the fiction space specifically. Um, I know a couple of filmmakers, um, there's this Nigerian um, director called Lola D, who's had, actually she has a film that's coming out on Netflix quite soon. There's a few Kenyan directors, um, Tosh Kitonga, um, executive producer for Kili Wali, who's Kenyan, um, the Nigerian filmmakers, um, South African filmmakers who have had um, either originals or, you know, acquisitions done by Netflix. So it's quite exciting that they're that they're coming um, into this space. And I'm sure they'll come into documentary quite soon Um, because it's true what you're saying, like um, grants are great, but they're highly competitive. So it's good to be able to diversify your um, sources of financing. And I think Mm -hmm. we're very excited about that. um, The fact that they've come to the continent and hopefully hopefully HBO and Amazon and all the other people are gonna follow. I mean, there's, you know, with the, with the global reckoning on race, yeah. there is a, it's, it's parachute filmmaking, as you call it, isn't really, to, no one tolerates that anymore. There's, a, you know, they, no one, they can't get away with that anymore. And those, those people who parachute in to tell the stories of Africa are, those films are not getting, you know, they're not, they're not getting greenlit. They're not getting seen. And that's, and that's because of the work that you guys have done because, because people realize that superior work is coming out of, from, from the filmmakers who live those experiences. Um, You know, I want to talk a little bit about the change in Kenya with, um, with the sort of, you know, the, the government and the official change in, 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 in the way people perceive non, nonfiction, because this year, um, the letter, the documentary, The Letter, was the Kenyan submission to the Oscars. Yay. I mean, well, talk about that, that. That must be have been a that was groundbreaking. Oh, that was incredible! Like um, we were so happy for the directing team, Maya and Chris. Um, yeah, because yeah, we uh, we are filmmaking community like in East Africa, so we're always talking about our stories and sharing our experiences with each other. So we were so happy um, about that, and there was a lot of encouragement from other filmmakers who had gone through this Oscar um, committee selection process at a national level. You know, to be able to encourage them on how to apply, and you know, the fact that they got chosen was a validation of um you know a validation in Kenya that documentary is cinema um I mean I know that but a lot of people don't know that so I I do know a lot of people who are like huh a documentary and they did a theatrical release um um after their selection and so many people went to watch the documentary and so many people were blown away by their access by their storytelling I mean Maya and Chris like have so many stories to tell about their filming process and it's such a beautiful nuanced um documentary and I'm so glad um that people actually got to see it in theaters and people are continuing to see it um yeah I just wish they'd gotten support for the awards run but we're hoping that next year uh, the Kenyan submission will get some support uh, for the yeah. awards run yeah incredible incredible um yeah. well I before we run out of time I want to get to some uh questions from student filmmakers mm-hmm. um so the first question is um what does it mean to develop quote unquote a documentary idea and what steps are involved And when do you know the idea is ready to pitch? Wow. Okay. I'll (laughs) tell you. (laughs) Okay. Uh, There's a lot there. Okay. I'll try and be as succinct as possible. Um, I would say development is testing your thesis (laughs) statement. You know, you might think you might have an idea and say, oh, I want to do something about like um, farmers and how climate change actually affects them in rural villages. Um, So that could just be the general idea. And then what you would do is 
you know, probably gather a team, maybe a cameraman, a sound person, or you would go yourself with maybe a small camera, your phone, and go and interview different people um, to try and maybe get a, a farmer to follow, maybe interview some experts, and then also do some research um, as you're filming or even before you go into the field, just to understand, is this, does this idea have what, you know, um, um, any validity? Are there areas that we could explore further? Um, and then I would just say it's just continuing that process. And I think when you feel like you have um, a few a few hours, I, okay, I would say fifteen to thirty uh, hours of of filming. You know, you could review your footage and try and edit maybe something small that you think um, summarizes um, the who, what, where, why uh, part of the story. And yeah, you would also accompany that with a write-up, a proposal. And there's lots of resources online um, where you can be able to just understand like how to create um, these specific things that I'm talking about, because I'm just talking about it in brief. Um, there's lots of on online resources. Um, and Sundance Cool Lab has a lot of free uh, masterclasses on like how to actually develop documentaries. Um, and I would urge you to go there and just look into that in detail, yeah. yeah. I've done the collab masterclass myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, next question is, um, uh, what is it like to show your film at international film festivals like Sundance? And what does a producer do at a festival? OK, um, yes, I'll try and keep this brief as well. Yeah. Um, it was amazing um, to just be at this you know, A-list festival that we'd never even dreamed we could ever have a film in, in competition. So that was just incredible. And we made sure we took the time to live in the moment. We even had an African themed party at Sundance because there was a number of African documentaries and films that were there. So we had a Kenyan DJ, Nigerian DJ. Um, so we were the best party at Sundance last year. Yeah, I, I heard. We were the best party and we played music from everywhere. So people understood that there were different kinds of music and cultural um, uh, nuances in Africa. We're, we're, not, we're not a country. Um, and then I would say outside of that, um, I think at a, at a festival, um, my work specifically was fundraising to ensure that we could take the subjects and the film team um, to the festival. Um, so going back to our partners and reaching out to new partners to support us. And then it was organizing the premiere because you have to do a guest list. You have to make sure you know um, all materials are delivered and then working with the publicity team to make sure that you're getting the right kind of press um, for your project. And also if you have a sales agent to that point, it's just making sure distributors, um, broadcasters are actually watching your documentary. Um, yeah, and then I would say outside of that, um, yeah, having fun. <laughs> Yeah, because your first premiere only everyone, happens once. <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone talked about how fun you you met everyone at Sundance. I don't know how you did it, but everyone would come to me and be like, "I met Tony and Sam and the crew and stuff." No, we were having so much fun. Yeah, no, we, <laughs> the we all, you know, we were tired, but we had so much fun. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, next question is, um, what types of stories do you think we can tell as refugees living in camps in Kenya? Wow. Um, I would say, I mean, this is, that's a great question. I would say as a refugee living in a camp in Kenya, uh, my working assumption is that it's other people telling you stories. Um, I would say it's maybe looking at what you find interesting about your life um that maybe doesn't fit into the narrative that you think has been created about your own experience uh, because i mean i want to i'm sure i'm sure people fall in love i'm sure um there's this interesting dynamics you know between you and your siblings i'm not trying to be simplistic but i'm just saying just like just understanding like what it means um from your perspective you know to be living in that place and in this um, point in time. So I would just say like look inwards um, a little bit just in terms of like what you think is interesting um, and what appeals to you um, about your experience or about your friends um, living in the camp. And you could just start with a short story. Um, there's lots of short stories that you, short documentaries you can find online. Um, 
I would urge you to look at Topic has amazing short documentaries. New York Times Opdocs has amazing short documentaries. Um, if I think of other ideas, I will I will read them up. But if you, if you start looking for short documentaries um, that take a short amount of time, I, I, I would say just um, start researching and find things that spark your interest. Um, because I think it's, it's important that you, as people who live in the refugee camps, um, ensure that you tell a story that shows the different dimensions of what it means to be you, um, that there isn't one story, um, that you're not just victims, you're not just displaced people, you're people with hopes and dreams who are complicated and nuanced and, you know, um, you know, have the right to share your own story. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's good advice that, you know, sort of watching, watching shorts, um, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, I, I, I have a series on topic of a short of filmmaker, BIPOC filmmakers mm -hmm. from around the world and I show their short films and I think that um, the, just to watch just what something can, someone can accomplish in, 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 in storytelling, seeing what can be accomplished in a short amount of time, whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes, it's just just powerful, powerful, powerful. And, um, and you can do that with little resources. So it's, um, it's just a, a great way to place to, to, to begin. Um, okay, two more questions. We're, we're, we're running out of time. I'm gonna, um, so more women are writing and directing movies and series. Um, do you uh, think we will see more Kenyan women filmmakers soon? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Um, actually, Kenya is an anomaly because across the world, um, the film industry tends to be male dominated. But in Kenya, um, a lot of the directors and producers are women. <laughs> like we have a long history of women filmmakers being pioneers. There's Anne Mungai with Saikati, there's um, Judy Kibinga who founded DocuBox who also directed uh, fiction. There's Jerry Carago who was a Hollywood executive and came back to produce um, documentaries. There's Wanori Kahio with Rafiki. Um, so I would just say that we're quite fortunate to be an anomaly because there is some le level of gender parity in this country. And I think it will only get better and better. Um, yeah. what, what, why do you think that is? Why do you think so many Kenyan women are directing films and succeeding? Oh, I, you know, I, oh God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into trouble for this. But I think it's, <laughs> I, well, I think it's, be, I mean, it's interesting because when, you know, like when people were first kind of like doing documentaries and film, it tended to be NGO funded. Um, and I guess that to a certain degree, I mean, the first people who started like directing and producing those projects tended to be women. So it was gender based issues. Um, so I, I think that that's where it comes from, from a certain degree. And outside of that, I would just say it's like my generation um, in my thirties, it's also just because <clears throat> I saw women like Jerry Carago produce and I knew it was possible. Um, I didn't have those gender barriers where it was just men um, yeah. producing in my country. So I think it was just, it was just possible for women um, to produce. Yeah. And maybe, and men, I think for some reason, like, the men who were pioneers in the industry tended to gravitate towards like cinematography, editing, because I guess they had toys to play with. Um, but I'm not really sure what the reason is. Those are yeah. just my own Well, questions. I think it's mm. nothing like the strong, powerful African woman, you know, the, back, <laughs> the backbone of every facet of, of society, you know, from carrying yeah. the water to... Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Yeah, there's that. Um, <laughs> we're the know. organizers. We're the organizers. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it makes it makes it same thing in the documentary in 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 the West. It's you know, many women are really you know an incredible force in the documentary industry in the West too. Um, mm -hmm. So okay, um, so running out of time. Last question for you is, um, um, who are your role models and what filmmakers inspire you the most? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is such a difficult question. Um, wow. 
we should be, you know, we should some filmmakers be sort of looking out for for inspiration, you know, if they want to, you know, watch some films, um, you know, sort of, you know, and be inspired. Who do they look and who do you who do you, who do you turn to? I okay, I would say I would say definitely um I love Usman Sumbene. Um I mean he's a prolific um African storyteller. And I think it was interesting because at the time that he was, you know, directing, you know, uh, a lot of African countries were were you know like um, achieving independence, and you know they were navigating what it meant to be a post-colonial state and what it meant to like craft your own identity. So a lot of his films speak to that in one way or another, and I find his projects, his stories, like especially revisiting them now, I find it very interesting because I feel, at least specifically for Kenya, like we are reimagining um, what it means to be Kenyan and what it means, you know, to be a country that's not really like forged its own identity after <laughs> decades of colonialism. I think we're still grappling with that as a country. So that's what I, I mean, his, his work really resonates with me. And I'll just say, because he's a classical filmmaker, he's fantastic. And then there's um, this other African filmmaker called Jibril Diop. I can never say his first name properly, but he did this amazing fiction film called Tukibuki. Um, I would just urge everyone to just watch it. Um, Jibril Diop, um, who's related to Mati Diop, uh, who did an Atlantic. Um, his doc, I mean, his films were very experimental. Mm -hmm. And I just found it interesting. I was like, a guy in the 70s and 60s was, was experimenting. I mean, with this new form, I'm like, that's so brave and fearless. And yeah, I think those are the people like I really look up to. And I mean, internationally, um, you know, you know, um, you, Roger, <laughs> as a filmmaker, I mean, you're a great pioneer. I would say Ava, you know, with the work she's doing with Array Crew, um, I mean, there's just so many inspiring um, yeah. filmmakers. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's <laughs> the list is quite long, well, but I'm I would, the ones that come to mind. Yeah, well, I would say that you, Tony, are an inspiration. Um, you know, not only being uh, the youngest and uh, producer invited to the Academy, youngest and African producer uh, woman producer invited to the Academy, but, you know, um, as a governor of the doc branch, when we looked around the continent for um, someone who could really speak to the, um, the, the new movement on the continent um, in, in nonfiction filmmaking and who was, you know, make doing incredible work and, um, and, and, and just could represent the community, you know, we didn't, we didn't have to look any further than, than you. So um, I, I thank you for everything that you've done um, for Kenya and East Africa and the continent and um, all the filmmakers that you inspire and, um, and, and on all that you, that we're going to hear from you in the future. You have so much, I mean, you're just bubbling up with so much energy and I, the, the work that we are gonna um, receive from you is gonna be so incredible. So, um, uh, thank you so much for what you do and thank you for being a part of this conversation uh and um yeah this is so thank great you. to talk to you so great to talk to you yeah yeah i'm so excited thank you it was amazing <laughs> great. and there's great. more of us coming there's more of us coming it's not just me oh, yeah. there is <laughs> a get ready, <laughs> get ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank the Academy Visiting Artist Series and Tony for being here with us. Tony, this was a pleasure uh, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roger. It was really amazing talking to you. <laughs>